formerly a gentleman's residence, now a library, modest enough among blocks of concrete and glass. Inside rooms, here the bedroom, there the bathroom. All lined with books, manuscripts. What do they mean? What is their purpose? The staff arrive, another day begins. the Western culture to which New Zealand is a direct heir. I think it's a, a wonderful thing to have uh, on the other side of the world uh, the first editions of the great works of English literature. Uh, they have their use for scholars of which I'm not competent to uh, express an opinion. How many books? 85 this morning, not too bad for Monday. I'll leave this A somewhat curious event is taking place, but nevertheless, life continues. How, how do you make a film about it? I should say it would be rather difficult to make a film difficult but not impossible. Um, because uh, there is so far as physical action is concerned, there is not a great deal of it. But I feel there is a lot of mental activity going on, or at least I hope so, that's what we're paid for. Um, so to make a film about this place, what one needs to do is to show our physical objects, but at the same time show them in such a manner um, that the viewer has no doubt about what those objects contain and then to show on the sort of people who come and consult them and why they consult them and the use they make of it. A reader arrives. By a relatively simple procedure, a book is acquired. A dialogue as yet undefined begins. This library has an international reputation. Somehow works of genius have come to be housed in a land unremarkable for its cultural prowess. And so young All Blacks are brought to be shown around in the hope that a little will rub off. This is the Treaty of Waitangi, of course, which is lent to us by National Archives for permanent display here. Um, unless you have all these sheets, you don't have the whole treaty including the small printed sheet at the top here. Uh, you can see the treaty looks a bit peculiar in parts here and the bottom of the parchment sheet. And that's because when it was stored in the big wooden gutter buildings on Hampton Quay, uh, the rats unfortunately chewed away quite a lot of it. Most of the Maoris, like most of the Europeans, couldn't write. One or two had been taught. Honey Hickey, who signed first, had been taught in his own name. But most of the Maoris signed, as you can see, with these rather cute looking squiggles and that is, represents part of that particular Maori's own tattoo on his face. Uh, behind me here, this portrait is Alexander Turnbull, the founder of the library, who died in 1918. He was only 50 when he died, and he left his library to New Zealand, to His Majesty the King, for the people of New Zealand. He began collecting uh, New Zealand books, but uh, he went on, he was very interested in English literature, had a very large uh, collection of both, on both subjects. I think myself that as time went on, he collected to console himself. He never married and lived a rather lonely life of a, a bachelor. Towards the end of his life, uh, he was rather overwhelmed by business worries. He uh, resorted uh, more and more to uh, to drink, and certainly more and more to book collecting, which was uh, 
similar means of forgetting his worries. But uh, one of the most uh, remarkable things is towards the end of his life, he conceived the idea of this great gentleman's residence. That's the present uh, Turnbull Library. That was built about 18 months before his death. He lived to take possession of it, establish himself there, but soon after died. Some of these pictures here are early views of Roland. I'll show you other copies upstairs and tell you a bit about what the operation was like over 100 years ago. Oh. These are our oldest books here. Uh, they're all printed before the year 1500. So they're all at least 400 years old, some about 500. Because they're all printed in Latin in those days. And this one has got particularly nice hand-coloured plates. See, on this side, they're like carnations. And down here, small strawberries. And here's David and Goliath down at the bottom. And some of these pages have got most lovely little patterns of gold. See the gold glinting in the light. That's burnished with polished with pumice to make shine. But this is one of our oldest books, one of the loveliest ones. where people open a book or a manuscript or a mind. What do they discover? Um, I'm trying to write a play about Catherine Mansfield. I, I started off just reading her short stories and I liked them, so I read the journal and some of the letters and I got more and more interested. So I think I'm, I'd like to write a play that incorporates scenes from her life as well as scenes from the sh dramatized scenes from the short stories. Oh, she was born in Wellington and um, lived here until she, she was about 15. And then they were taken to London by their father, who was quite rich, where they stayed for about four years at an elegant, fairly academic girls' school. Then she was brought back to New Zealand and hated it. Finally sort of begged and pleaded and became so obnoxious that her father decided to send her back to England. And then she met this, this man, John Middleton Murray, um, who was editing a new magazine called Rhythm, and she sent some stories to that. And uh, he was fascinated by her because she was playing the Bohemian a fair bit at the time in London. Um, you know, he met her at a party like this and got fascinated by her and came to her place, and they talked for a while, and it ended up with his moving in there. But um, they didn't become lovers for quite a long while, and one day she, she asked him, why don't you... Why don't we become lovers? And he, she said he lay on the ground and raised his legs in the air and waved them about and then said, I feel it would spoil everything. And she got consumption quite early in her life um, and she was forced to, to leave England because the winters were so severe she had to go to south of France and warm climate. She kept working as hard as she could but um, she was plagued by this illness. Tonight, when the evening stars shone through the side window and the pale mountains were so lovely, I sat there thinking of death, of all there was to do, of life, which is so lovely, and of the fact that my body is a prison. I write that. I look up. The leaves move in the garden. The sky is pale. And I catch myself weeping. It is hard. It is hard to make a good death. Ah, uh, Miss Walton. Yes, Another yes. problem, child, if you don't mind. My Blake Williams has done a watercolour of Wellington from the Wellington Club in August 1865. It's rather an interesting view, but I want to establish, if I can, the precise sight. The door opened. It was a pleasant day outside, but gloomy in here. I mustn't be frightened, she told herself, as she stepped tentatively into the immense room. As always, the dusty atmosphere made her nose tingle. Boldly, courageously, she moved down the aisle... Hundreds of yards of a book-lined basement can conjure up illusion in even the durest imagination. 
240, 300 social sciences. Suddenly she heard something. What did she? Stopping, she listened again. Nothing. Imagination, she thought, and moved on, but now a hint of fear in her footsteps. There it was again, a definite sound. She was there alone. What could she do? The phone was at the other end of the room. Don't be stupid, she said to herself, behaving like a frightened schoolgirl. 700, the arts. 750. What was it? A shape, a figure, a shadow. All reason had gone, she imagined herself lying and paled to the floor by the pin from the catalogue drawer. Footsteps behind her, getting closer, she was near the end of her strength. Desperately, hopelessly, she flung out her hand and grasped. All is well. The pen is mightier than the sword. And so, to another interview. For two national magazines, I'm doing features on gold miners and two veteran gold miners of last century and this century were Arawata Bill and Moonlight. We have fascinating records of these old timers here, including photographs. This is Arawata Bill. Um, he died in recent times, in this century. He was a grand old chap, and in his youth, they say, through a love affair, which didn't work out. He got fed up with the ways of civilization, and he would retreat into the hills and into the southern parts of our southern Alps and the bush and the creeks and the rivers, prospecting for gold. And he never married. He took with him his horse for most of the distance, and he also carried a large camp oven, a great iron pot, in which was porridge. And he'd, as he went along, he'd reach for a handful of porridge every now and again. He also was baked by a housewife in the back blocks, a beautiful sponge cake full of cream. And the old man bit into it, I've found out, and his eyes lit up and he said, it's just like eating fog. And Phil is doing a national bibliography with Mr. Bagnall, but it's also a subject specialist in that he's very interested in archaeology and anthropology. He just took a field trip over to Capiti, a site recording with the Wellington Archaeological Association. And, and Sheila, well, she's the head of the cataloguing department. Uh, that's a massive organisation needed, and that speaks for itself. And she's also interested in archaeology and studied Māori at university. And it's got a great many connections with people throughout the country, and this helps a lot. Also, her background coming from a family of Māori scholars and, and New Zealand bishops helps a lot, the Williams family. And Mr Bagnall. Well, he's, of course, the chief librarian, and... But he's not just an administrative sort of head. He, he really is a person that all the whole profession looks up to. And, you, and his work with the National Bibliography, this five-volume work, which will list all works published in New Zealand and published about New Zealand, is really the culmination of his whole career. The librarians. Most tend to specialise in one field or another, but the mundane they all have in common. There are letters to answer, inquiries to be dealt with, microfilm to be edited, manuscripts to be filed, catalogues to be updated. The Hyderabad, you want to know the date when it was read? Um, just a minute. Five and a bit of stuff. Five and a bit six, I'm in seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty, twenty-one, twenty-two, twenty-three, twenty-four, twenty-five for you, and twenty-five dollars. At twenty-five dollars all done. At twenty-five dollars all done, turn the library twenty-five. The library is constantly acquiring new material, by auction, by donation, or by more unorthodox methods.
sometimes old houses destined for destruction yield long forgotten documents. Yes, sir. Has Mr. Barton gone to lunch? Do you want to speak to him? Yes, please. Oh, well. We're all being film stars. Yes, that's right. Um, what's he doing here? Oh, we're researching for New Zealand's heritage, the Port Hamlin publication. We're picture researchers. Look for illustrations for the articles. Well, generally we start off trying to find something relevant to the subject, find what it's all about, and from there we go on to think of what possible illustrations there might be relevant to that subject. Something that is usually has plenty of action, of human interest if possible, plenty of people rushing around pursuing their normal activities you know, relevant to the subject. Um, to convey information as well, isn't it, to tie in with the article? Yes. Rather, rather than artistic values. Well, at the moment, I'm working on about 1865 articles about that era. This covers a lot of Maori wars, usually, because I think it was from 1860 to 1870, there seemed to be constant feuds for some reason or other. Well, there's plenty of paintings yeah, around. <laughs> In fact, it's almost overwhelming. Some are good and some are bad, and we can afford to choose. A lot of the men who were fighting painted. As, I don't know, they were, should have been fighting, but they seemed to be painted. <laughs> <laughs> it's quite amusing to imagine them rushing along, surrounded with <laughs> pencils and watercolours rather than at guns. Actually, I don't know. I don't think they would have painted right on the spot. They probably just remembered what they'd seen and painted afterwards. Because one thing that makes the library so very important is that we have not only, as I said, almost all the published books about New Zealand and the Pacific that we can get, but also manuscript material, which is mostly unpublished, letters, and diaries, some official documents and so on, and maps and pictures. There are about 10,000 pictures, most original paintings, and also photographs. Now, the pictures cover all sorts of things. Um, we're lucky a lot of them are very good paintings, but that is sort of a secondary uh, consideration as far as we're concerned. This is one of the white terraces. Uh, and this is one actually we published as a print this year, because these were destroyed in the Tarawera eruption <laughs> in 1886. And that's really quite a good idea of what they were like. They were very big, covered seven and a half acres. And then this is the sort of thing that's particularly useful. These are two views of early Wellington, done in 1841, from right at the corner of Lampton Quay and Willis Street. It's right in the heart of town now. And of course, Lampton Quay, the main street, was just the beach line. That's why it curves around the way it does. And of course, as well as uh, early paintings of the country, we have a very large collection of photographs as well. There are over half a million. And this collection gives a marvelous record of New Zealand of the past. Sure, because Mavis had got it mixed up, but she thought the damn boys. The day wears on. Another reader, another book. Everything has a lifetime. Things fall apart. When they are priceless, they must be preserved by science. 
More and more, the reader is handed a microfilm. The choice is negligible, either a first edition of Milton which has fallen to pieces, or a first edition of Milton which you cannot touch unless it does fall to pieces. Unfortunate, but nevertheless, mechanization must invade this sanctum as well. Well, you're not so much reading the microphone, you're, you're looking at it, you're searching for things, you're trying to find your way around. There's such a lot of information. Uh, page, page after page just goes on and on. That's why it's good. You want it that way because it stores easily. It's very contained in itself, but for, for using, for old habits die hard. But there is still the reader and the small world created for him by a piece of paper with some words attached. Well, we're doing a bit of final checking for a book that we've written. Um, dealing with a kind of scrapbook, a kind of historical scrapbook called I Take Up My Pen. It's a subsidiary title of an early colonial scrapbook. Isn't that the other title? Yes, because it all grew out of a... Uh, sort of stage, not exactly a stage production, but uh, uh, costume readings that were done for my wife's society, the women writers. She's president of it and got this uh, going. And uh, one interesting thing is that they talk just a little bit differently and they dress a little bit differently and the advertisements mm. read a bit differently. They're fascinating. They were very much more literary. That's when, that was the beginning oh, of yes. all this. Was that, uh, these letters were uh, very well written letters. Uh, they were all bursting uh, with their new experiences, whether they hated them or loved them or were knocked sideways by them, weren't they? And they wanted to yes. let the people at home know about I think the majority experience. of the letters that we read, uh, well, so many of them begging uh, friends and relations to come. Very pleasant. I wasn't seasick at all. My wife and children were seasick five weeks. I was cook on the outfit and they gave me six shillings a day. How, how are things in New Zealand? Very pleasant. The natives are a very quiet set of people. They're stout and tall, about six to seven feet tall, and copper colour. There's plenty of shellfish and plenty of wild pork. And you get fat on wild pork, which is good. No fruit, no coconuts. Just nothing but fish and wild pork. Would you recommend that, that people come here? Dear Father, tell all your friends, and the young men in particular, to come and bring their wives and children, for this is a good country to settle in. And kind regards to Uncle Cogger. But mechanization is invading in another more drastic sphere. The building is cramped, it is unsafe, it is an earthquake risk. Anyway, a motorway wishes to proceed. The books and the institution are to be moved to a new edifice, the National Library. Alexander Turnbull's home will take on the bulldozer and lose. There is a charm about the place. There's a, uh, a sense of past. And I think that New Zealanders are too quick to discard their past. Uh, we tend to go in for progress and motorways and concrete and uh, say, oh, well, that building's old, it ought to be pulled down, it's, it's dusty, it's uh, uh, in the way anyway. It's in a, you know, we want a motorway here, we don't want a, a, a library. I feel that if I'd been an administrator, you know, with a decision to make, I'd have hoped to have had the sense to keep something that was valuable from the past. Oh, I think it is. <clears throat> I think the, 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 the special atmosphere that was generated in this house uh, is something which cannot be replaced. On the other hand, it's not um, a suitable building for a very great library. Mm. It, it's outlived uh, its, um, it, its value in that respect. It could only be kept uh, as, a, uh, as a museum. It couldn't be kept as a, as, as a living institution. Which the Alexander Turnbull Library must be. I must admit.
admit that I was uh, quite impressed. It's not, of course, everybody's... Uh, uh, it's one person's uh, view of the Turnbull Library. Perhaps I dare to say a filmmaker's view of the Turnbull Library. Others, uh, others uh, uh, have other impressions. But too much of um, some things, perhaps not enough of others. What do you think, Ray? That there are a couple of things that, uh, uh, that I, I might have concentrated on more. The manuscript room, which, which I see as the core of the library. We have, after all, uh, 2,000 linear feet of manuscripts of considerable historical and literary importance. I don't think we've emphasised the very large English literature collection. Not only Parky House is the place. You have to imagine the parts that are missing. There are um, other writers the, in the uh, country. The reader presentation. I would say the most practical uses of the place. Not only we see ourselves, of course, which is probably very... Not everything's shown, thank you. <laughs>